about myself and why I'm running. Um, I was raised in El Prado. I have lived and worked in San Angelo for over 27 years. I have used my degree in criminal justice as an employee for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Parole Division for over 26 years. I'm married to Gilbert Gonzalez. I have a daughter, Brooke Sanchez, and a stepdaughter, Polly Gonzalez. Both girls graduated from the St. Angelo School District. I'm a member of Paul Ann Baptist Church and have been for over 20 years. I am now retired and would like, and would like to use my time to not only serve as a representative for District 4, but for the city of St. Angelo as a whole. When I started to think about running for office, I thought about it and thought about it. I was like, what is it that I want to do? And it's been in my heart that I have had this passion all my life about wanting to help people. And when the opportunity arose, I decided to take it. And that is why I'm here in front of you today, because I've stepped out of my comfort zone. I've decided that this is what I want to do. I want to help people. A couple of months ago, I had a lady that called me and she says to me, um, I have one of your signs here out in my front yard, but I won't be able to vote for you because I'm on parole. And I said, well, that's fine. What is it that I can help you with? And we discussed her problems and what she had been going through, that she hadn't been able to get any help. And um, she informed me that she and her sister were both MHMR clients. So I asked her, um, have you gone to, MH to your caseworker? and asked her if she could possibly maybe get an apartment for you and your sister. And she said, well, I don't, we don't want to move. We want to stay in this home because this was our mom's home. She goes, and at the end of our conversation, she ended it with saying, it's just that we're tired of having to wash our dishes in the bathtub. Well, this is happening in my district. And this is why I say that I want to help the city employees, help the citizens of San Angelo. I also, went through this firsthand, first experience. It happened to me not too long ago. I was wanting some help from the city, and I did not get it. So two days later, I'm talking to the city manager and explaining to him, this is why I'm running. There's got to be something that needs to be done that we can bridge that gap between the employees and the citizens, or we can get some answers. So. The, the, mind you, the city employees do a great job. Just yesterday, they were out there helping the community. They were painting, they were working at the animal shelter, they were doing all kinds of things. This is great, this is good to see. I love to see the report and the relationships that they're building together. But at the end of the day, I would like to see that the citizens walk away thinking, I was heard, my questions were answered, and I'm good with it. Um, I have always been a person that most of my adult life have been put in a position that I gather information and then make an informative decision. I would like to do this as your next city council person. Just get my information and then, and only then, make a decision that's going to be the best for all the city of San Angelo. Thank you. Andrew Justice. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I I want to thank the uh, our panel and our uh, our questionnaire, and I truly want to thank you for coming today. Uh, I am originally from California. I was born and raised in California. Uh, I am the oldest of four children. Uh, I have been I've been raised in a Christian family all my life. I hold those values and those principles dearly. Uh, I. We moved from California to Flystaff, Arizona in 2000. And uh, prior to moving to Flystaff, I had worked for the Department of Defense as a civilian employee at a, at a naval facility that, in, that encompasses a million acres. And so I worked on RD, research and development, testing and evaluation, uh, electronics and mechanical engineering. I I went to work for the National Weather Service for five years in 2000. I have worked in the field on their equipment, as for all of the equipment that the National Weather Service has. In 2005, I retired on a disability retirement. In 2008, we moved to San Angelo, and 
and uh, I went to work managing a local radio station with uh, all the all the technical details I'd already learned on how to manage a, a radio station, even that small, handling the programming, handling the equipment, bringing everything up together. Uh, I am married. My, uh, I've been married for 27 years. I have a son who's 21, a junior at ASU, and a daughter who's 18, a junior at Lakeview. When we moved to San Angelo, we were just welcomed. I, I had. I had the greatest feeling like like I was like like I was part of the community the first day I was here and it was it was a wonderful feeling. I hadn't had that feeling since we lived in California in, in such small towns. And I, I truly appreciate that and I would like to give back to the community, you know, as part of that thank you for for their helping us. Part of what I would like to see done in San Angelo is I have a vision to see not only families flourish, but to improve and diversify your economic base, add in more manufacturing type businesses, add in more, more businesses that bring in good jobs. And the reason why I see that is at any time, BRAC could come back and, and it could it could hammer Goodfellow, and even if Goodfellow took a 20, 15 to 20 percent cut, it will affect our it will affect our community. And if oil takes a takes a bigger drop than what it has now, it's going to affect our community. And what I want to see is is different kind of jobs that help keep you employed and help keep you having food on the table, the, the mortgage paid, the rent paid and give you the opportunity to succeed in areas that, that are outside of just Goodfellow and Oil. And I'm not against either one. I think both are great, but I want to hedge our bets and not just, and not just assume that those two are going to always be here. And one other thing is city debt. I want to make sure that we stay on the, on the straight and narrow and not use up you know any surplus that we have right now just because we have a surplus and, and I realize our tendency is to is to burn that surplus when we have it you know I'm guilty of that myself and, and so I want to see us to spend wisely and to spend in areas that we need to and finally uh, water and streets are the two big hot topics they have been this whole race and, and and I agree, but I want to say thank you to the citizens, you out there who have conserved water more than, more than anything else. You have helped keep us from, from being in a deficit of water beyond what, what we could have handled just because you have conserved. And our streets, I want to see our streets get fixed. And I realize that we already have capital improvements in place, and I want to see those go forward, and I want to see those get fixed. So, as your, as your representative for District 4, I will push for that. And as your representative for District 4, I will look for opportunities for new jobs. And, and not just in District 4, but in all of St. Angelo. And I thank you, and I, I would uh, appreciate your consideration during this election time. Are there any... Are there any questions for our two candidates for District 4? Yes, sir. Um, let me start out with uh, asking Ms. Gonzalez. Um, of course, both of you were at the follow-up at the Pat Durham Club meeting. You stated that you wanted um, to have a look at better city economic and business-based situations. Could you be more specific uh, on how you would go do this? How will you do this? I believe that was Andrews. Was that Andrews? I'm sorry. I am so sorry. That's okay. Okay, let me state with you, as you have stated before, 
you're not an experienced politician. That is correct. <laughs> but you, uh, what you're doing you, to get yourself prepared, what are you doing to get yourself prepared to be no, more knowledgeable to some degree of city government I if have, you're elected? I have, I have gone, I have attended um, city council meetings since that time. I have um, been informed, I've spoken to previous city council um, people that um, have informed me of how they've handled things before, how they go about finding the information, how they have come to their decisions that they have made in the past. So um, a lot of it is going to be things that I'm going to have to read about, learn about, and be informed about in order to be able to do the job. And I feel that I can do this. This question is uh, for Mr. Justice. You have, you have said that uh, you would like to see uh, truck routes within the city. How do you propose to come up with that plan? And, and of course, the reason for doing that, uh, obviously, is road maintenance. Trucks are very, very tough on our streets, and it could be very expensive. How are you going to do it? How are you going to pay for it? Uh, thank you. Um, part of what we're going to have to look at is is to survey the city where the where the major truck routes are, and in the process of surveying the city, find out where the businesses that require trucks are, and then t take a take an evaluation of where of where we can do that and either look at having a gasoline tax if that is if that is appropriate with the voters you know a half cent or you know look at other ways of doing that but yes I realize that's expensive and I realize that it, it is a a significant cost and a sin, significant uh, issue for the city but I also realize that that maintenance wise we, we could save some of our other streets by uh, by having designated truck routes. Mrs. Gonzalez, uh, you uh, you mentioned in one of our questionnaires that uh, you might consider taking part of the half cent sales tax for. Uh, the water infrastructure repairs. Uh, uh, how much? Uh, how much money do you think that uh, that would involve, and uh, how would you go about doing that? Okay, as far as the half cent sales tax, I believe that even now what they're doing is that they take so much, and it's for water projects. And I believe also, um, not too long ago, as a matter of fact, the last council meeting, they proposed to not give the rebate. Um, because the goal was not met. I believe that they had in their budget, operation budget, under a million dollars. And their, um, their goal was close to five million. It was four million nine thousand nine hundred thousand dollars So um, I believe if they continue to do this, that the, the fact that we will be able to have money saved up so when these projects do arise, when we do find the resources, that we're able to find to have to, to along with um, Abilene in uh, Midland and together with San Angelo and we find these forces, resources we'll be able to finance. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Justice, uh, you mentioned the uh, possibility of uh, imposing a half cent fuel tax to assist with uh, road repairs and maintenance. Uh, uh, how, how, how much money do you imagine that would generate and how, how would the how would it be administrated? Um, with a half cent sales tax, again, I would ask the people if they would want this. But I would say, based on the amount of fuel that's used in San Angelo, we're probably looking at, uh, I, I'm going to swag the figures because I haven't really run them yet. I would say somewhere between two and three million. 
And so at, at that point, you, you, you take each street one at a time and you just you bite off a chunk you can handle with that, with that money and you set it aside and you just continue to, to work and repair streets and not, work, and not try to bite off more, more than you can chew, as they say. How do, you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mrs. Gonzalez, you uh, uh, mentioned an experience you had with uh, with someone who lives in single member district four who needed some assistance. I, uh, could you give us your assessment of, of how the city's doing in assisting some of its poorest residents, and what you think uh, in, what what you think can be done in that area? I believe that um, as far as the assistance, uh, some people are very confronted they they want answers and they will continue to look for other people when you're told um, no they're not eligible they kind of just go back and say well I can get the help um, I know that there's a lot of resources available out there and I know that there are uh, organizations that do help um, people get their homes fixed and stuff but apparently this lady has not reached that um, organization and I would like to see that happen. And I would, whether I'm elected or not, I, I really want to go and help this lady see what she can do. I, I do have some questions now if I can bring this in. Um, a follow up to uh, Mr. Justice's question about the haps and sales tax. Sales tax is a very regressive tax, hurting the poor. And hitting them the hardest. Uh, do you have any ideas of raising revenue that are less regressive and, and less uh, oppressive on the poor? Uh, good question. Uh, I have not looked looked at any further than that yet. Um, I'm afraid if we raise property taxes, we're we're right in the same avenue. If we raise sales taxes, we're going in the same direction. And I also realize that that some of the poor actually don't drive as much as some of the some of the rest of us. And so yes, that that does hit them in their pocketbook. But at, at some point in time, I also look at it this way: the longer we allow our streets to be unmaintained the more it's actually costing them in maintenance costs, not only for them, but also for the city as, it, as the wear and tear on our vehicles. I have uh, a question here for um, both of you. Um, all candidates have spoken about our streets and the need to repair them. Where or how do you propose to find the funds for this very expensive project, which is kind of a similar to what I just asked? That's for both of you. Well, I believe that the amount that they were talking about is the $150 million that it's going to take for us to fix our streets. Um, I believe that they have uh, the debt that the city has right now is at $170 million. They have come down from about 250 million. So we're making progress there. So I believe that they would look for loans for us to be able to get our streets repaired. We, we do have, I'm sure the budget shows that there is money there available to start fixing the streets. Um, in time, they have a period of maybe a five year term that within uh, so long that they would, they in five years, they, they would be able to raise enough money. But the, the, the streets do not only need to be repaired; they do need to be maintained, or we will be right back where we are today. Um, back on that that question again, uh, I I look at it this way: Yes, we do need to repair our streets, and it, it there is a five-year capital improvement project already set in place to to deal with our streets. And I know there's money, there's some money set aside on that. And I believe that over five years, with proper management, we can get our streets fixed. And, and I'm not one that, that believes we need to do it overnight. That, 
that, that to me is a sign of desperation. And I realize our streets are, some of our streets are in bad shape. And we need to attack them soon for, for, the, for the benefit of the city and for the benefit of the citizens. But, uh, you know, I am, since I'm only one vote in seven, I have to also defer to the rest of the council and say, how, how can we work together and, and solve this problem a little bit at a time and make sure we get all of our streets fixed? I have three more questions here for both of you. Uh, comments have been made about the need for growth and economic development. How do you see this being accomplished? Well, um, I've spoken to um, Mr. Pena, and he's our economic developer, and he is working on a project as we speak right now. Uh, he's wanting to bring in more industrial and commercial businesses into town so that, in fact, our, our city can have more money and not have to raise any kind of tax to our taxpayers at this time. Um, I believe that it takes time, but it will eventually come to pass. We will have these businesses, and the only way that I see that it happening is the fact that the, the, our economic developer is the one that, that's his job, that's what he's supposed to do. And I believe that when these opportunities arise, he will be able to accomplish that. I have been talking not only to the president of the COSO DC, but also to the Chamber of Commerce. And I've just recently talked to one of the deans at Howard College. And, and one of the avenues I, I want to pursue is not only is not only you know economic development as far as new industries, but also also set up an educational plan that will take advantage of, of what we have in St. Angelo as far as education, maybe adding in some more education that programs that help, you know, in the electronics area where where it's easily established and those jobs do provide, you know, a good income for people that have those skills. Uh, as a technician for not only for the National Weather Service but for the Department of Defense, I was making almost sixty thousand a year as a technician in the electronics field. And so I will take my background in, in the engineering and be able to, to find those sources where we can and, and see which, which opportunities will be best and work alongside with our mayor, with the rest of the council and with the, the development corporation and the Chamber of Commerce to find, those, to find those individuals and those companies that want to come to San Angelo. And, and use and use our resources, especially our manpower, because between ASU and Howard College, we do have some of that already in place. We just have to have the right jobs and the right industries in here to do that. This again is for both of you. If you were elected to represent uh, District 4, how do you see your role as you serve not only District 4, but the entire city? I would see myself representing the whole city on issues that I can be informed on, that, that once the information is given to me, that I will sit here and make the best decision that's going to be for the, for the whole city, not just my district, but the whole city. Um, but the main thing that I think that one needs to do is be informed and know what it's, it's going to revolve around. What is it? What are the good things in it? What are the bad things in it? Before making an informative decision. I, I view this as a two-fold process. Number one, I got to get to know the get to know more of the people in District Four, hear their concerns, hear their hear what's what's biting at them and then be willing to listen and provide answers. And second, you know, again, be, be a voice on the city council, you know, approval, disapproval, and, and to help work with, 
work, work with the other members to solve the problems in the city. And none of those are, are, are easy. None of those, none of those are, are instantly done. Those all take time. And, and I, I completely agree with the fact that this job is a, is a hard job. And it takes men of, and women of caliber of integrity to, to do it. I'm sorry I'm getting these notes in as you guys are talking. I don't mean to be rude. Uh, this would be for both of you again. You've mentioned that economic development and their jobs, but what will you do to support that person's role in the city? And then, well, let me give you that one, and then there's another one on this one too. Okay. I, what I'm assuming is, um, economic developer uh, hiring or having an economic developer in their jobs and how would you support an economic developer's role in the city I'm assuming that's what the question means okay what I'm understanding is that when an economic developer comes toward I mean comes before the council and will ask about whatever project that they're wanting to develop. Uh, I believe that once it's presented, that the council will see it through, see, ask, the, ask the proper questions and find out what is it that they're wanting to do, what it, how much would it cost, you know, the things around it that are gonna complete it before approving it or disapproving it. That's what I get from the question. As far as economic development, uh, there, there is a process. They have to go through the permits and planning. They need to be you know, up to speed with uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Coastal DC. And, and I'm gonna have, you know, for me, I'm gonna have to ask the hard questions. Have you, have you walked through the process? Have you gone and visited with the people? Have you, have you checked every avenue? Have you checked off every box for for fulfilling your requirements to to become you know part of that economic development for the city you know to, to add your name on a piece of property and bring in a business that will help build up the city this is uh, from the same individual uh, although each of you is one vote you still have relationships with each other how will you work with your fellow council members to best represent the interests of the people of San Angelo? I believe that the, the way that you would get along with everybody is we respect each other. First of all, we know we all have different opinions, but when you have something that you need to vote on, you respect the fact that there are individuals, you have your say, your beliefs, and at the end of the day, you will respect each other and get along with each other because you will continue to work with each other. And as long as you know in your gut that you made the right decision or that you feel you stood your ground and you felt like this was what I needed to do and you do it, you're going to be okay and the relationship will continue and you will get along. And this is for the best of the community. I completely agree with that. You, you have to be willing to to take the high road, and, and that is to treat everyone fairly, to treat everyone as valuable. And, and whether your opinions are, are are opposite or not, you still have to you still have to work with them. You still have to treat them a, a, as a worthy as a worthy valuable commodity on this council. You know, as far you know, if we start bickering, we start fighting and dividing ourselves, we are going to accomplish very little for the city, and, and I do not want to see that personally. Jack, can I follow up on that for just a second? Um, that sounds great, but I, I think my question is, do you think you're being a little idealistic? We can be, we can always hope for the best, but uh, in the long run, I know that, there, that there's conflict. I know that there's 
uh, times that people don't agree and it goes over, you know. But really, it, it's individuals that are going to react the way they know to react. And in your heart, you know what you need to do and not be the type of person that's going to hold grudges or because you're here, you're elected, these people have put you in a position to represent them. And when you do not represent them with respect, then you're really not doing your job. You're doing a disservice to the community. So yes, there will be probably times that people will have the conflicts, whether I'm elected or whether Mr. Uh, Justice is elected. We won't know till we get there, but I know how I would want to act. Yeah, I'm, I have to agree. I'm, I mean, idealistically, yeah, it's, we're talking about a perfect world. This is not going to be a perfect world. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a perfect relationship. And so I have to take each time, each day, with the, with the proper attitude that that I'm going to have to be willing to listen as much as I am going to be willing to talk, and probably listen more and, and take the counsel of those that are with me, you know, with with as, just as much as respect as their counsel of me to to find that find that resolution. Uh, I have spent a number of hours troubleshooting, you know difficult equipment and sometimes the big, the biggest thing to do is or the best process is to take your time and just figure it out one step at a time and find all the solutions and find all the troubles and then come up with a plan versus just tacking it with a with a sledgehammer and say oh, we're just going to fix it we're going to beat it to death and then we'll, we'll have something here that we can that looks like a mess but we'll live with it I, I don't want to do that I want to. I want to see us work together if we can. And the final question that I have is: I'm going to take you guys back in time to 2014. It is April 1st, 2014. How would you have cast your single member, member districts vote for the trash contract, uh, either for it or against it? How would you have cast your vote? Knowing what I know, because I don't know the inside, I don't know what goes on in the sessions, but knowing what I know, I would have probably, with the information that I've been given, I would probably have voted to approve it, for the mere fact that we, from what I've heard, we had to make a decision. It was a good one, the council thought about it, and apparently four out of seven thought so too. So, I would have I would have said yes to the to the contract because I do believe that they did the best that they could, and sometimes that's all you can do is the best that you know is going to be good for the community for, for our citizens. And I think it was wholeheartedly uh, done that way. They did believe that this was going to be the best for the community. As far as the trash contract, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and it always is. And so, at the moment, uh, you know, I have to look at the variables that we have. I have to look at, at the situation we're in. And I have to look at the, at the body of work from previous history of, not, of both companies that bid on this and, and ask them, are they going to do the citizens of St. San, San Angelo the best, the, the best possible business? And the best possible good for the city. As far as voting one way or the other, I, I cannot say right now because I, I don't necessarily have all the information I need to to, to garner a vote for that. But uh, you know what's done is done as far as I'm concerned. We just need to move forward versus working backwards. This one's for all of you. So. Uh We'll come back and probably give the mayoral candidates the same question. But right now for the, the two of you, in making decisions that require your knowledge of our city's ordinances, policies, zoning requirements that are there to protect citizens, how will you make these hard decisions for San Angelo? Again, you have to be informed. You have to know what are the ordinances, what is it that are need to be updated what needs to be changed mostly is getting in there and learning what you're actually going to do um like i said um 
in my previous career. Mine was all about gathering information and then making informative decisions. Um, I'll just give you an example. When an offender would violate his parole, he would have to be taken to a parole hearing. During that time, I had to gather the whole process of taking him to that hearing, which meant get, go into the police department, get in the arrest report, get in the witnesses, and then they would ask me, the, either the offender or the family would ask me, what are you going to recommend? And I would say, I don't have a recommendation for you. I cannot tell you because I will not make the decision to where in that hearing and I have heard the last person testify. And that's what I'm saying here is you cannot make a decision until all the information is in and everything that you know about that ordinance has been reviewed. And if you don't know, you find out. I look at it this way. We have people that are in the city that they have work on the codes and ordinances all the time. And, and those are the first people I want to talk to. I, I want to get their perspective. I want to get their expertise. I want to glean from them what they know. And then base that, base that, whole, th that whole idea on code and ordinances in, in conjunction with the council and, and work and work in a, in a responsible manner to to either update or leave the ordinances alone. But I, I want to hear from them because they're the ones that are in that are down there working on those on a daily basis. And yes, I do want to do my research. I want to know what's going on. But I definitely want to hear from them because the last thing I want to do is make their job harder. This question is for both of you. <clears throat> when the uh, uh, proposal to build a uh, uh, sand transloading facility over on Hill Street came up, there was enormous public opposition to that, even though uh, it, it fell within the uh, uh, it fell within the ordinance. What do you think the city can learn from that event? Um, I I can only tell you I was not too informed about what was going on at that time. I did hear the, the controversy between the people and, and uh, the population and the, and the council. But what I can tell you is that when this community came together, they came together in numbers and they got what they wanted. And that's really good to see that when the community comes together, things do get accomplished. Yeah, I, I didn't know much before I only heard after the fact, and I have to agree, the city spoke, the community spoke, and, and I have to fall lock and step with them versus, versus just running headlong into whatever, whatever I think is best for, for the city without taking into effect the, the community, their feelings, and their opinions. Uh, the, uh, the city recently, uh, and this is for both of you as well, the, uh, the city recently uh, was notified that uh, or negotiated an agreement with the First Financial Bank to, uh, uh, to purchase the building on Beauregard Avenue uh, as a new police station. Uh, the, there's been talk about demolishing that building and building a new structure uh, versus retrofitting that building to make it suitable for a police station. Where do, you, where do you stand on that issue? Um, first of all, I don't, I don't think they're going to demolish it. I think that building can be used for other offices that the city may need to use. Uh, the water department has been there forever. They, they probably would welcome wanting to use that, that building. Um, the thing about it is, is that that was, that was a process that they did. They they're wanted to build um, a police station that is very much needed. But I do not think that that building is going to be what they're going to use it for, for the mere fact that it's the same square footage as the one that they have today. So they really didn't get more to be able to, to build onto it. So I think that in the, in the long run, it would probably benefit the city if they used it for different offices that are much needed also. So just tagging along, um, I'm sorry, but can I go ahead and ask for both of you so you can reply to him and also respond to this question? Um, 
how much is the total cost of the police station building project and how is it going to be funded? As we know, we've heard different ways that it's going to be funded, but if you both would answer that and answer the question that he had to go along with that. Well, this much I do know is that the city, I think they're approximately paying $1.8 million for that building. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't remember the exact figure. But I also remember hearing from Chief Vasquez saying that there was some set-offs that this building did not fit in as far as requirements from the federal government. And so there obviously needs to be some consideration on that part too. As far as the funding, we're obviously going to have to work together to find a viable resource all the way around to to support this. And so I'm open to, to any opportunity that the rest of my council members find that works best for the city itself, knowing that, that each one of us has a stake and has an and has a desire to, to support the city and you know the police station because we obviously see that there needs to be an update in the police station. Neil, everything he said was I agree with you, except one thing. The funding, the funding is going to come from the citizens of San Angel. They're going to put it on uh, on the ballot and they're going to ask do you want a new police station? And then that's where the money's coming, is from the citizens. Ken, um, in regard to property taxes, uh, the, uh, the city has been steadily decreasing the rate at which it taxes properties. However, uh, uh, because of appraisal increases, the, uh, uh, the property owners in San Angelo are, incre are paying increasing dollar amounts. Uh, do you see uh, uh, any way to give, give property owners tax relief uh, through, uh, uh, you know, through some means that the city could institute, for instance, uh, Try to forecast what the appraisal increases are, and keeping the dollar value amount uh, within a certain limit by the rates of these. Uh, I'm trying to think about your question. Uh, you're wanting to know if the property taxes can be decreased? No, but uh, uh, some way of controlling the the amount that they increase by, other than. The just setting a rate and letting the appraisals fall in it. Um, I am not sure that I can answer that question at this time. Um, thinking about that, obviously we could cap the the, the amount that's, that's taxed and I realize there's a rate that's on there already set by the city. But as far as, as dropping that down, I, I think that we got to find a happy medium someplace along the line where we're collecting enough tax to support the city and yet not collecting too much to the detriment of the community. And, and as the economy grows, obviously the price of houses is going to go up. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a tug of war basically between people's pocketbooks and, and the city's coffers. Um, I don't have an exact solution right now, but uh, again, I'm, I'm going to ask my, my council members for some advice on this one and find out what they think and how we can work together to, to, find, to find that area of reason and compromise within our city. Well, if there aren't any uh, further questions at this point, uh, we're, we're just about to our one hour limit, so maybe we can take, uh, take a five minute break and then we'll come to the middle again.
about kind of like Like to determine how much you get paid, pretty much. But my friend and then Martin 
I was wondering if you were going to show up, y'all. Yeah, we had a bunch of shoots this morning. We had that. Um, we had that. Uh, Did you do the walk around? Yeah. I didn't. We had somebody else out there this morning. We had the uh, the, the trip from the Memorial Lawn in Fairfax for the fallen veterans in Texas and travels around the state um, and their honor uh, on their best. So we had that at like nine. We started to catch the rain for a while. Then we came back and had to get frontier days, and then we came here. The <laughs> one, Fort Concho. What time did you? And this is our early sports, yeah? Uh huh. The pancake breakfast wrapped up around 11. I do watch you at night. Oh, thank yeah. you. This is um, Liz. She'll be doing K San weekends. Liz, nice to meet you. Jim Sox is going so sedentary. And as everybody says, man, you got a big one enough there. Oh, don't wow. You? <laughs> Yeah, I'm so gonna take no one questions the, about I'm it. I'm gonna take one for the scene. I get, I get when I tell people when Excel Center is in these days, they go, Oh, you're in Standard Times. What part of this did you <laughs> Did I speak in Spanish? <laughs> What's your name again? Liz. Liz. Yeah, Elizabeth. Dana, right? Yes. So, uh, how long have you been with uh, Kelly? Since August. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. You know what? I was really impressed. I want to give you a compliment. Um, when we went out to the uh, airport and they had the Homeland Security and that uh, press conference, yeah. they did an outstanding job of pushing. Oh, thank you. I, said, I, was, I, was, I was sitting behind, I was in the back. Man, she projects real clear. She's very confident. She's very articulate and asking good questions. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. I figured, you know, I didn't know if they would like my questions, but somebody well, had to ask because it's 80 blocks for a five year membership for a small airport. No one is really going to use that service so much. It's mainly in the larger airports, but it was nice that they said yeah. that for, you know, a sound bite. And then you were right there too when you got that man. Mm-hmm. Just walked up. All right. Your name. <laughs> I got the next one, it wasn't as good, the next interview was the next gentleman. That guy was alright, he didn't speak too much, so I only used one of his sound bites, and it was only like 8 seconds, but it was better than nothing. The press conference was the main thing, um, it was just difficult because not all of them you know, presented their names and titles, so they would track them down afterwards. I was able to get a lot of good uh, photos and a little blurb on that post on Facebook. We do the Facebook, I'm uh, part of social media, so Facebook. Twitter and uh, post our news promo on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take sound bites off of this one and uh, dump the file and the whole footage on YouTube. Uh, that'll be good. I feel like this is uh, a, long, has a lot higher attendance than their usual forum. Uh, this is about the same one we had it last year uh, when at the Stephen Central Library. That is too big a crowd. They want to team up in their time. Thanks for wanting to kick. It's definitely a great event. We have Thanks our reporter covering the profile next week. Awesome. Um, so it's good for her that we're here. Who's going to do that? Georgia. She works for both sides. Yeah. 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 Is she already she been on? Yeah, she's done a few packages. She doesn't make her though. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sometimes like a joke. You know, and, and it's interesting, I said, it's almost all girls behind the camera, so when I meet y'all, I go, okay, put my foot in my mouth, you're not with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting to know who you are. Yeah, our only guys are Michael Stafford, who's the male anchor. Um, we have Dan and Matt uh, Weather, who are the women's anchors. And then we have Jonathan, Andrew, and Jeff from sports. Rachel's a girl who does sports, but those are the really different guys that we have. Oh, and Eric, because he does the four o'clock show. That's just so different from the rest of what we do. <laughs> Who hosts the uh, I'm glad we're getting some money. It's on KSN, isn't it? Uh, the Contra Valley Live? Right. We have that on uh, KLS in Eric. Well, it's KLS. Mm -hmm. Come on again here. How, do we, how, how, do, how does somebody like us as media go on there to promote our stuff? Would we be able to get to meet as far as the media competitor? Or is that just for. I'm not sure. I think you'd have to ask, like, email Eric about that. Uh, he has, like, his email like, on our website. Sure. But Eric. Eric. Let me find him on Facebook really quick and find out what his last name That's so bad. That's how I always figure out what everyone's last name is. Your website is Mm-hmm. And so he'll be posted on there. Yeah, he should be on there. Let's see if I can pull him up on here. My reception is really bad.
So his email should just be e henriksen at klst dot net. each of the mayoral candidates uh, the five minute uh, time frame to start there and present their positions and then we will follow the same type of format that we did uh, for the uh, district four candidates and if you have if i have some questions up here if you have questions please uh, send them up to me and uh, we will start and uh, go in alphabetical order so we will start off uh, with uh, the mayor first. First of all, I'd like to say Standard Times, thank you for this opportunity and for this forum. I'm glad to be here today, but even glad, more glad, I guess, that you are here today. I appreciate you attending our forum. I wrote this speech yesterday morning. It's four pages long, and it is an excellent speech. It's funny, it's uh, informative, it's even inspirational. 
And I worked on it all day long and read it and practiced it over. And I was ready to give it until about 9 o'clock last night when my son sent me a letter. And after I read this letter, I, think that I determined that I would spend my five minutes reading the letter that my son wrote. Because the way he has written this and the words that he has written is far more succinct than anything that I am capable of reading or anything that I am capable of saying. So this is my middle son. His name is Brian David Morrison. Vicki and I's middle son. He wrote this, and I want to read the letter to you. It's called This Election. It begins, and I'm going to read this word for word just exactly as he wrote it. It begins, this election has been tough. It has been taxing, and even at times, even personal. This election, at its core, is the story of a man. This man, despite being a novice, decided he wanted to serve his city as a public official. He threw his name in the hat, and off he went on the campaign trail. This election is the story of a man who was spurred into action after witnessing what he considered ridiculous or even an unconstitutional action by the current city council. He determined to do better than those that were there, and it was not long until the first yard signs were proudly displayed around the city. This election is the story of a man whose platform existed only to bash a very controversial decision made by the council the previous year. Platform may be too loose a term. The man only knew he disagreed with their vote. He had no real answers to any real problems, yet he loudly and proudly spoke his mind to any that would listen some did, and many followed. This election is a story of a man who tried to shield his ignorance with sarcasm. His words often spoke with contempt for the current leaders, and condescension was often prevalent in his campaign speeches. When one does not know the facts, it is easy, you see, to speak freely and to be critical of others. This election is a story of a man who did not know what he did not know. People like this are often dangerous and are prone to offer unrealistic solutions and promises that cannot be fulfilled. This election is the story of a man who sought out public office for the proper reasons, at least as far as can be determined. His heart was in the right place, but quite often his mouth moved faster than his mind. Rude behavior should not be accepted by civic leaders. This election is the story of a man who ran full stream ahead in the steam and ahead in the campaign, talking with possible constituents at any possible opportunity, and he entered the backstretch of the election brimming with confidence, oblivious to the fences that he had erected between his supporters and those of the other candidate. Now, you, now I know that you're probably thinking what you're probably thinking, and you're probably wrong. This election is the story of a man, and that man is Dwayne Morrison. You see, Dwayne's first attempt to enter Sangelo politics was not successful. The year was 1986, and the city had just passed a very controversial sign ordinance that greatly affected Dwayne's small car lot and the fence business on the North Chatham. He saw as this as a reason to enter politics and ran for the city council seat of North Angelo. He was young and brash and sometimes obnoxious. His platform was simply to be the dissenting vote on the inept, dim-witted council. And on election day, the public realized the negative attitude, and he was soundly defeated but he learned from his mistakes. This election is the story of a man who bided his time, learned the nuances of city politics, and honed his skill. He waited 16 years until the time was right, until the man was right, and he successfully ran for city council. His fervor has not changed, nor his belief in standing up for what he believed in regardless of the outcome. This election is the story of a man who served 10 years on the city council as a representative of North San Angelo until he decided to run for mayor. That campaign was also successful. Never one to shy away from difficult decisions, he willingly accepted all of the challenges that presented themselves. At times, the decisions were tough, and unfortunately, enemies were made along the way. Through it all, his experiences and maturity were evident. This is a man who learned through the baptism of fire how to lead. This election is a story of a man who wants to serve two more years as the mayor of the city of San Angelo. So consider your options. Evaluate their strengths, evaluate their weaknesses, and make your decision wisely. Insight is not something gained overnight, nor does one issue make a platform. Vote experience, vote wisdom, vote confidence, vote for Dwayne Morrison on May 9th. I have any time left? 
Yeah, yeah, no, you've got time. I do? Okay. I'm just scratching my ear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my son wrote that. My son knows me better than anyone else other than my other two sons and my wife, and I appreciate very much the words that he said. I think that my strength as a mayor in the last two years has been the ability to negotiate, to compromise, and to bring the right people to the table. I am one voice. I am one vote. And nothing happens on the city council unless four people agree. So I can walk in like a like like the what my way or the highway. I can walk in and I can bully my council. I can walk in like I'm the only one that whose vote matters, and I'm going to get absolutely nowhere because I have only one vote and one voice. So I've taken it to use gentle persuasion to persuade people to see things my way. And I've worked hard for you as your mayor. I have worked tirelessly, and I have represented every city in this city, in this city, and I have strived to be the mayor that everyone in this city could be proud of. I have made mistakes. I have admitted my mistakes. I have tried to rectify the mistakes I've made, but I have learned from my mistakes. Every vote that I have taken has been conscientiously considered, has been conscientiously studied. I have done my homework, and I have not made one vote that violates my conscience. I was born and raised in the city of San Angelo. I still live here. My children live in this area. And every vote that I have made affects not only you and your family, it also affects me and my family. And I will do nothing to harm the citizens, my family, or the city of San Angelo, Texas. I have worked hard for you. I have tried to represent you in every way. I have been the voice. I have been the face of San Angelo. I have attended some 1,500 functions. And I'm asking you now to help me. Help me for two more years. Let me be your mayor for two more years. Let me work the five priorities that we have established as a council that we want to accomplish. Give me two more years to work that we can complete this. I am Dwayne Morrison, and I ask for your vote on May 9th. I'm David Nowen. I also thank you for being here. I appreciate you coming to hear us uh, and your interest. I have with me today my wife on the back row and my daughter Lila. We have six children. Uh, Lila's our youngest. She's 12 years old. We uh, adopted her from China right before she was a year old. And uh, we've been coming to West Texas for 18, 20 years because we bought hunting property out here. We fell in love with San Angelo. My wife and I made a conscious decision when we got Lila that this is where we wanted to raise her. We saw the potential in San Angelo, uh, fell in love with it immediately, and we haven't looked back. We're, we're happy to be here. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, a few points, one of them being leadership. Mr. Morrison and I agree, disagree on, on several things. Uh, I don't believe that his style of leadership and mine match at all. Uh, I believe that he's some of the things he just described that he wasn't. I think that wanting four votes all the time is not a goal. I want seven votes. I want a general consensus on that council. I constantly hear him say, I can't do anything without four votes. That's his only interest, is getting four votes. If you're going to be a good leader, you're going to have to learn how to use your influence, because the mayor doesn't have a lot of power. If you can use your influence to better another person's life, then that's leadership. I would think that many of you, if you haven't, all of you, you should, experience what it's like to change somebody's life, to help somebody when they really can can make a turn in their life for the better. And what's really gratifying is to have that person call you back uh, two or three or four years later uh, when you haven't seen them and tell you, uh, you know what you did? Changed my life. It turned me in a different direction. And I just wanted you to know that. That's happened to me several times. There's nothing, there's no greater reward than that. And I want to do it on a grand scale. I want to do it for 100,000 people. And my only reason to want to be your mayor is to see this city be better and you to have better lives right along with myself and our little girl. Now, our business sense. I don't think Dwayne's a bad guy. I don't think he's a crook. A lot of people say that all the time, that Dwayne's a crook, he did a crooked deal. I don't think he's a crook. I think he made a mistake. I don't think he made a good deal. I don't think he looked that trash contract over well enough. And had I been doing it, I found that most contracts that you really look over, you're going to find flaws and errors and things left out, omissions, 
And I think he got bad advice, took that advice, and he led that council in the wrong direction. Had I been the mayor, uh, one of the questions a while ago was, would you have voted for that contract? No, I wouldn't have voted for that contract. Uh, and there were three more people on that council that agreed with me. Had I been the mayor, we'd have been going the other way. We'd have still been working on it. And I don't want to even try to make me believe that we wouldn't have been getting our trash picked up. We could have uh, extended that by whatever means necessary. They don't mind asking us for an extension. Now I want to talk about transparency. Transparency to me is telling the truth and the whole truth. It shouldn't take uh, the Freedom of Information Act to prize loose that original contract with Republic or this campaign to make it come out and say what the deal is, which is what's happened here. And a lack of transparency is a lack of respect for the people. There was an outcry not to do that. And the mayor, along with three other council members, went for it anyway, against what the public wanted. I'm not gonna be that kind of mayor. I listen to the people. I want desperately to have my finger on the pulse and know what the people want and evaluate that before I cast a vote. If I'm mayor, you can count on me to listen to you. As a matter of fact, I know I can't do it alone. I don't think for one second, even though I'm 61 years old, uh, started been successful at several businesses, that I have the answers. I know that there's not a single one of you in this room that couldn't school me on something if uh, given the opportunity. I, I'm not prideful. I work for you. You don't work for me. And if you'll let me be your mayor for the next two years, I won't focus on making meetings and campaigning. I'll focus on making this city better, doing whatever I have to, whatever I can, to better our lives, all of us together. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see is what you get. You can count on me to do what I say I'll do and to be what I say I am. I'm David Nowlin, and I mean it when I say God bless you and God bless San Angelo. I have uh, more questions for you, Mr. Nowlin, than I do for Mayor Morrison. And then I have some questions for, I'm assuming, all four of you up there. And I'll come to those last. Let me start off with you, Mr. Nowlin. You voted against Lee Fluger's Sand Frat Depot operation on the uh, ZBA. How do you reconcile your vote within the balance, I'm assuming balance with property rights of Mr. Fluger? I'm assuming your question is uh, you voted one way in the zoning board, and how do you reconcile that with the issue of property rights? I'm all for property rights. I believe when I made that vote that a sand transfer depot there would have been uh, uh, heavy manufacturing, not light manufacturing, and it was on for light manufacturing. I'll say this publicly, I said it to Mr. Fluger and both attorneys, and by the way, both attorneys are supporting me for mayor. Uh, we walked through that deal and did it methodically, did it right, and got a general consensus, so, uh, uh, a 5-0 vote, and uh, everybody's happy with it. But when it comes to how he was going to do that, if, in my opinion, if he just said, if he was stuck to it and said, I want to do this and this is how I'm going to do it and the way that, that they laid it out, we would have had to call that light manufacturing. And had that have been the case, I would have been forced to vote uh, to allow it. But when I asked the question, and he had already said he wasn't going to do it, so I asked the question, if we allow this, then would the next person coming in here have to do it that way, or would they be able to do it just like Mr. Wardlaw had presented it, that it was done in Barnhart? And the answer I was given by the city attorney was, no, they could do it any way they wanted to, just like Barnhart. So, that would have made it, in my opinion, heavy manufacturing, not light manufacturing. So that's why the reason I cast my vote the way I did. Uh, let me give you another question that I'll 
That's uh, Mayor Morris and what. In an interview earlier, you said that, quote, I am not Dwayne Morrison, end quote. That statement is true because experience seems to be one major difference between you two candidates. Please tell us what experience and knowledge you have of our city's overall functions, finances, staff, and departmental policies that you feel gives you that edge over our current mayor. Well, for one thing, I think my business background, um, I can't do this with the city, so don't anybody take this wrong, but I know what it's like uh, to sink everything I have into a business. I've done that more than once. Uh, I know what it's like to, to make decisions under pressure. Um, I believe that that's a difference between Mr. Morrison and I. I believe that we're both in our 60s. Uh, it's our, a lot of it's our age and our life that uh, takes us forward to this, this time when we could uh, be able and willing and ready uh, to run a government. I'm not cutting down any young people that might be better at that than us. But as for myself, I just believe that my business experience, what I've learned about leadership, and leadership uh, has been a natural thing for me all my life. Whenever I was a young man uh, in my early 20s, uh, I was working for a major construction company and they told me, David, just be patient, stay here. Uh, you'll be running this place someday. Well, I was too too eager. I mean, a year is a long time when you're in your early 20s or two. And I moved on and did my own thing. But I just believe that uh, making the decisions that I've made in my own business practices that and, and knowing what I know about leadership, that I'm prepared uh, to run this city. And I know that there's going to be a learning curve. I'm also prepared for that. I've, and talking to the right people, knowing that when I step into this office, I, I'm not even gonna be able to run the meeting as efficiently as he is, because he does it every time. But it's not rocket science. I'll catch up to it real quick. And the issues of the city, I pay attention to them. And I don't plan on making any decisions by myself. I don't plan on being the, the decision maker. Before I go into anything that's on that agenda, I'm gonna ask other people's opinion and advice on it. So it won't be just me. Thank you. I'll give you a break now and Thanks. give a question to um, Mayor Morrison. At previous forums, you announced your support for transparency. Uh, Two million of that trash contract cash bonanza to subsidize water bills, commercial trash. Costs have risen 50 to 72 percent. Isn't that cash bonanza hidden tax on businesses? Am I clear on what? I'm standing. First of all, I would like to say that I'm not going to get down and dirty and negative in my campaign. I will do nothing but be positive. I will make nothing but positive remarks. I will not resort to name calling because I have plenty of accomplishments that I have accomplished in the last two years. And on the chairs out there are brochures that tells of the five priorities that we have established as council. And there's also a brochure on the back that gives all the transparency, the conditions, the contract, and the charges on the trash contract. So I'm not going to resort to name calling. I'm not going to get down to try to tear someone else down to build myself up because I don't have to do that. My campaign has been positive, and it will continue to be positive. That is my promise to the citizens of the city of San Angelo. I think now that the question was about the transparency of the trash contract. The trash contract was negotiated, and it was negotiated when in, without allowing the contracts, the two contracts, to be made public. There is a matter of law. We had two respondents. We had Texas Disposal, and we had Republic. We sent out seven proposals. We had two that came back. Both of these ended, both of these companies sent us a proposal. As city, we have a, a, a contractual law and a contractual, uh, we have to obey and to honor the contracts. Had I put Republic's contract up on the net and made it public to everyone in the entire world, I would have violated the contract 
that we have between Republic and the city. Had I put Texas disposals up and gave it to the entire world, I would have violated a contractual agreement that the city had with TDS. There is a matter of law right in the middle of transparency and of confidentiality. I can say it this way, when you pick up a rope with confidentiality on one end, transparency on the other end, and law in the middle, when you pick up that rope and pull in it, you pull everything on the rope. We have law where we are obligated as a city to obey and to abide by the contracts and the security of the contracts. Immediately after these contracts were negotiated and signed, both contracts were placed on the line in our website in their entirety. You can go there today and read it. You could have gone there in the middle of August and read it. There's nothing that is not transparent about those contracts. But no one, if I went out on a fence bed, and I did many of these in my 25 years, if two competitors go out on a fence bid and I give you a price after I have bid it, I don't turn around and give that contract to my competitor. That is simply not the way things are done. And everybody in business realizes that you have to keep your negotiations silent until a contract is signed. And that's what we did. Uh, then we talk about the $3.6 million. A landfill is a tremendously expensive and a tremendously valuable asset. We have not been receiving the value for our land fee. When we sent out the two proposals, we said we have a valuable asset here. What will you give for our <coughs> asset? Republic said we will give you $3.6 million for the privilege and the honor of working your land fee. TDS said we will give you $0 for the use of your land fee. Republic said we'll pay you $550,000 a year lease. TDS said we'll pay you zero per year for lease. Republic said we will pay off almost a $770,000 debt that you were paying for on your water bill for the methane flaring system that the state mandated. Texas Disposal said we'll pay nothing. There is an $8.4 million landfill closure fee that must be in the bank when you close a landfill. We're about 10 years away. Tex uh, Republic said we will pick up and pay for the $8.4 million fee that you, the citizens, have been paying for for the last four years. TDS said we'll give you nothing. So Republic said we will honor and take responsibility for the landfill, past, present, and future. TDS said we will take zero responsibility for the landfill, past, present, or future. And in fact, we will, we will expect a letter from the city to indemnify us from any responsibility ever. Tex uh, Republic said we will provide you two pickups per week, one trash and one recycling and we will charge you what we negotiated out with sales tax and the city fee for $15.12 per month. TDS started at almost $18 per month for the exact, let me repeat that, exact same service. Then we have to add the landfill closure in there. Then we have to add the flares back in there. Then we have to add the $170,000 that we pay each year, you pay as citizens, for the one free once a month pickup. When you get through with sales tax of the 5%, you're up to approximately $22 from one company where we have $15 for the other. That's about $7 to $8 difference. And I give you a range because these are estimates. And we got tens of millions of dollars up front from Republic. TDS said, and I quote, we will operate your landfill for our cost plus 20%. That is writing a blank check from the citizens of San Angelo to TDS that we could not, we could not negotiate this contract any other way than the way we negotiated it. And there were seven members of the city council, unanimous vote to go with Republic. Thank you. This, I'm just gonna ask, ask all the questions uh, out of respect for the people that wrote them. This is similar to the, the question that I just asked you. And so you may not have anything more to add to this, Mayor, but uh, here's the question. In today's campaign, the trash issue continues to come up. Many citizens do not understand how the contract came about. Can you explain the RFP process? You, uh, the RFP process that the contract negotiated? I can't. It, yeah, it's similar to the one that I just asked. <laughs> no, it's a little different. 
our trash contract that we have had for the last 30 years, which is the very best trash contract in the entire free world, expired on July the 31st of 2014. That means that on July the 31st of 2014, that contract that we have enjoyed for the last 30 years ended, which means that on August 1st of 2014, we had three choices and three choices only. We sent out seven proposals for a request for proposals. Each one of them was exact in their wording. Each one of them had the exact same qualifications. Of the seven that we sent out, we had two that responded. That means that on August the 1st of 2014, we could either go with Republic, we could go with PDS, or you could be burning your trash and hauling it to the dump yourself. There would have been no service. And those were the three options we had because the contract expired. Yes, we could have negotiated with Republic to have extended it. But when that contract ends, the contract ends. And they would not have been obligated for any of this upfront money. They would not have been obligated to stay with the prices that they came up, that they offered us and quoted us. And had they got word that the other company was giving nothing to start and was way up here above them in cost, Republic would have pulled on their contract and you, the citizens, would have been holding the bag. So we sent seven, we got two. We had to make a choice between one of the two. Did that answer the question, or did I miss something? I think it did. <laughs> um, I have three questions for uh, Mr. Mal, and they're all similar, uh, dealing with leadership. So let me read all three of them, and then if you'd like me to go back to one of them more specifically, I would be. But they all seem to consider uh, leadership issues. Can you explain your thoughts of having, quote, authority over council and the citizens of San Angelo qualify you more so than a, quote, one person small business owner, end quote, uh, that has leadership skills? And uh, another question dealing with this. Uh, with all due respect, if you had to do it over, don't you think it would have been a good idea to get elected to the city council? find out how that works, learn the issues and the system before you took a shot at the mayor position. And finally, I'm, con I'm concerned with your ability, experience, and understanding how to proceed when it comes to leading city council meetings through detailed discussions, intense controversies, and in giving citizens the right excuse me, the rightful opportunity to speak before the council. My concern comes from observing you as you quote ran the ZBA meeting that heard the appeal of the city planning director's decision on the sand depot back in February. How can we be assured you can do the job of mayor with professionalism and authority when it seems that you are not comfortable with your role as chairman of the CBA, they all deal with, uh, with leadership issues. And uh, let me let you respond if you want me to go back to one of these. Well, we'll start with that one and go backwards. Okay. Um, on the uh, sand transfer depot, first of all, my opponent was telling his constituents or our citizens, nothing can be done. Uh, he talks fast and uh, comes to quick conclusions, and that's not leadership at all. I, on the other hand, told the board, let's don't talk about it. Let's let this unfold. There was a lot of controversy, even when we weren't supposed to be talking about it, and it wasn't on our, our agenda. We have people coming in there and, and want to talk and, and won't stop, and I tried to be polite to them, let them talk, and I realized we're going to have to take this one step at a time. Uh, we'll, we will need to have them write their questions down and keep this in control. If we don't, it's going to be chaotic. And I believe we walk through that exactly the same way. And as I'll point out again, the attorneys on both sides are satisfied with the way I ran that meeting. Uh, it was lengthy. It was stressful. But we got it done. And both of those attorneys are supporting me monetarily uh, and with their votes. Now, I think that speaks largely to that as far as how you're going to, uh, or how I will lead a council, it's going to be with kindness and consideration and respect. And anybody that comes up here to this podium 
to talk or make a request. It doesn't matter if it's one person or 200 people in here. They're going to get my same attention. Everybody has a right to present what they want to present. I'm not going to cut people off. I'm not going to be rude to other council members. And there's plenty of videos out there if you'd like to go watch them. Uh, uh, of the mayor and myself. I don't believe that I've ever been rude to anybody. I've had to stop some people from talking when uh, we gave them a time limit, but that is what it is. But I'm very considerate of, of other people, the other members. If you'll notice, whenever I run the ZBA, I don't cut people off. I don't uh, call people by their first names or pet names. I treat them with respect, call them Mr. and Miss, and I, let, I usually don't even make a motion. Or rarely do I second, I let the members do it. And I walk through it with leadership, not like uh, a boss. In my companies, I can be the boss uh, if I want to. I also, to address, I think it was the first question um, about uh, running one-man companies, one of the companies that we run as a corporation, I'm not the only one that, that has a say-so in that company. Uh, I have to listen to other people, one of them being my wife. And it's not just uh, my way or the highway. We decide what we're going to do. And I decide what's best. I've always looked at it this way. What is going to be best for that company? What is going to be best for the people that it affects and myself last? I can tell you this. 